Ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated by animals. I filled my parents' house with snakes and lizards, birds and insects. But it wasn't just the individual creatures I was interested in. I was curious how the whole of the natural world worked. In particular, why nature is the way it is. Not just animals, but plants too. The theory of evolution claims to explain it all. That's why I'm doing a series of experiments first done 150 years ago. It's beautiful, isn't it? I will introduce a snake to a troop of monkeys. <laughs> prepare breakfast for a plant that eats insects. First time I've ever fed a bit of sausage to a plant. <laughs> now, here we go. And I will serenade an earthworm with classical music. It's all about Charles Darwin. He carried out these experiments and many more to help unlock the secrets of evolution. Inspired. Uh, Outrageous. Uh, no, they're not impressed. Yeah. Illuminating. Right, OK. Let's go and see what they're up to. <laughs> I've never, ever done this before. These experiments test Darwin's theory of evolution. It was seen as dangerous then and still seen so today. <laughs> Charles Darwin's voyage to the Galapagos Islands is the stuff of legend. But there's another part of his life which is much less familiar. It's perhaps the strangest story in science. In 1842, the ambitious young geologist shuns most of his scientific colleagues and shuts himself away in his country house in Kent. For nearly 20 years, he refines his theory in almost complete secrecy. He runs a series of clever experiments that explore the different elements of evolution. And it's this extraordinary work I'll recreate. What's remarkable is that Darwin hides the manuscript that could change the world forever in a cupboard under the stairs. Darwin turns his house, his gardens and his greenhouse into a laboratory and embarks on what I think is one of the most exciting series of experiments and observations in scientific history. Piece by piece, Darwin builds up his picture of evolution. This journey is as full of adventures and unexpected challenges as the one he made around the world. Now this is a copy of a sketch Darwin made in one of his secret notebooks. And it's a really good illustration of how he saw evolution. And it's, it's a kind of tree of life. And at the base of the trunk is a common ancestor. And all the branches coming off of that represent different plants and animals that have evolved over the eons of time. A simple enough diagram, but it's a radical new way to look at the natural world. Every branch of Darwin's tree of life shows an extraordinary process at work. Ancient creatures transforming into a myriad of modern ones. Evolution. Controversially, Darwin has replaced God, the creator, with evolution, the process. Darwin knows it would be difficult to make others accept his theory. The church will attack him. The scientific establishment will ridicule him. Even his own wife, Emma, a devout Christian, disapproves of his work. In his modest study, Charles Darwin works on the biggest idea in biology. His theory will try to explain the whole of the natural world. But as he ponders the complexity of life, he must have wondered where to start. In the end, his first experiment is quite unexpected, almost random. I want to start where Darwin starts, 
with this revealing experiment. I'm just trying to find some compost. Luckily, I can get most of the stuff I need from the garden centre. The garden centre has plants flown in from all over the world, but Darwin wants to show how plants travel around the globe by themselves. It's not as obvious as you might think. I bought myself some seeds and some seed compost. And basically, I'm going to put seeds in salt water and then after a period of time, see if they grow. And so this looks like a very simple experiment, but it's answering a much bigger question of how plants spread around the planet. The idea for Darwin's experiment about how plants travel is sparked by a letter from his friend, the botanist, Joseph Hooker of Kew Gardens. Hooker tells him that he has discovered that many plant species living at the tip of South America also grow on the remote islands in the Indian Ocean. Hooker challenges him to explain how this could happen. So, to see how Darwin answered Hooker, I'm going to my farm in Suffolk, where I'll recreate his seeds experiment. I have a copy of Darwin's notes to help me follow his thinking about how plants spread. Open up the notebook. So, we need 35 grams of sea salt for every litre of water. It's almost like a Charles Darwin recipe. And in fact, that's what his experiments are, and that's what all experiments are, is you follow a recipe. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to do, because it's... You know, it's, it's like being a, a kid again. You're putting all things in and seeing what's happening. And when you think of science, you think of expensive laboratories and advanced equipment. But really, you can do very important science with some really basic equipment. If the same plants are found thousands of miles apart, most Victorians assume God simply chose to put them there. And that is that. But Darwin sets out to provide a scientific explanation which doesn't require the hand of God. If these seeds germinate, it will show that it is possible for plant seeds to travel the ocean. It is possible for them to survive for a period of time in salt water, in other words. But it's not conclusive evidence. It's not saying, yes, this is completely right. It just adds another, another piece to the jigsaw. I'm saying it is a possibility. Because there's lots of other factors that, that how seeds travel around. They cling on to, to animals, uh, they get blown in the wind, continents move with the plants on them. So it, it, it's not saying it's a definite, but it's, it's adding that little bit more evidence to say it could happen. Darwin wants to prove that seeds can resist salt water, usually considered poisonous to them. Right, let's put them up here. The seeds can soak for a month in the salt water. And we'll come back and see how we get on. Darwin calculates that an ocean current can carry a seed halfway across the Atlantic in four weeks. So he soaks his seeds in salt water for a month. And so will I. Now, have any of my poor seeds made it? Right, they look completely different. Let's get these out in there. Oh, they absolutely reek. I'd be very surprised if any of these seeds have survived. Oh, they're like old socks or something. It's like a compost, it's like that, that, that real sort of rotting vegetation. Right, OK. So I'll pour them in here. Oh. 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 Um, oh, good lord. Smell that. That is vile. Plant these quickly. Oh. My hunch is the ones that smell the worst have been destroyed by the salt. 
Perhaps a few of the less pungent have survived. Right, okay. Tomatoes. Oh, they're all congealed together. Let's see what these guys are like. Actually, they're not so bad. That's all right. Let's grab some of these with the tweezers. And finally, get to plant the seeds. Right, let's pull the last of that away. Okay, I'll put these on here. And we'll see if they germinate. I can feel Darwin's excitement about the experiment in a letter he sends to Hooker. All I want to show is the possibility of a few plants being transported by currents. And by Jove, I will. Darwin doesn't rely on his experiment alone. He writes dozens of letters to seafarers and shipwrecked sailors to gather valuable information about plants in remote corners of the world. So I've decided to visit Southwest Island to find out more about how plant seeds travel from marine biologist Dan Minchin. And we're here today on uh, this beach and island to find evidence to support Darwin's idea. Yes, um, we, we, we look along the strand line because it's storms that come in from the open sea here. Yeah. And it, well, even on a day like today, it's not a storm, but there's a, a, a reasonably brisk wind blowing in. And anything on the surface could be blown up to the, the high water mark where all the floating weed and everything collects. And, and that's the place to look. So all this stuff along here potentially all has seeds in. There are some places that you can look in which are more likely to have seeds than others. Basically, it's seed compost, isn't it? Mm. There's a bit of drift fishing line that's come in here. And so seeds will be attached to that, will they? Or? No, no, no. They, 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 you'd find them, it's nice and light, you see, but you'd find them at much the same kind of level on the shore. Uh, just yesterday, now, uh, I found this seed here. This is a, a horse's eye bean. It's actually one of the ones that interested Darwin. And the coat of that. It's thick as the leather on your boots, you know? Oh, that is, isn't it? And you wouldn't be able to crack that open with your teeth. At sea, the tough covering of the horse's eye bean keeps salt water out. But once on land, if the coat is damaged, fresh water can enter. Then the seed swells up, bursts its coat and grows, just as Darwin predicts. As long as it only happens occasionally, then that's enough for him to prove his argument. It's a tough assignment for a seed, because the great majority of them will not be able to develop. But it's not impossible. Along the coast, Dan Minchin has tracked down a remarkable flower. The seeds of this plant, the sea pea, have floated all the way across the Atlantic. Darwin would have been delighted to have known of these immigrants. These are really quite special, because it's the only area in Ireland where I think they exist. And uh, the parents of these particular plants are in North America, and their young are here. This is the seed part here, OK? Oh, uh, you can see where it gets its name from, the CP. You yeah. can, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they produce this root system, and from this root system you have all of these plants. And what an epic journey, from a seed entering the ocean in North America... Yes being washed all the way across the ocean and then arrive on the beach here, get blown up, favourable conditions, it germinates, the seed germinates and grows into this plant here. It completes the story. Yeah, absolutely. But the only way Darwin can prove that plants have the potential to cross oceans is with his experiment. If his seeds survive the salt water, they can get on land and grow. Now's the moment to see how my seeds have got on. I wonder if their coatings have successfully kept the salt out. It's quite dramatic, really. We've only had three of these six plants germinate, so it's all or nothing, really. And it's a no-show on the peas. Let's go through this systematically. Right, OK. So first up, 
tomato. Yeah, that's a germinate. So that's a tick. The tomato, onion and cress seeds survived. The other three failed. A success rate broadly similar to Darwin's. We've proved that some seeds can indeed make it through a whole month in salt water. A small scale experiment with worldwide implications. Six plants were enough for me, but Darwin seems to get carried away with this one because he studies 87 different types and then goes on to do even more experiments along the same lines. He does so many experiments because he's convinced that travel is a key driving force of evolution. When younger, Darwin sailed to South America and the Galapagos Islands, 600 miles out in the Pacific. There he saw animals and plants perfectly suited to the environment of each island. But there's something else. These animals and plants were noticeably different from their relatives on the mainland. Land reptiles like the iguana had become marine living in the Galapagos. Darwin collected everything, including many small finches. But it isn't until he's back in England that he understands the full implications. One finch, the cactus finch, feeds on the prickly pear cactus. Another, the ground finch, has a thick beak for cracking seeds. while the woodpecker finch teases insects out of holes. Darwin comes to believe that all these different finches with different talents are descended from a single species, a small group of finches that must have been blown out to the Galapagos from South America long before. Over time, this one type of bird had evolved into many different species. But of course, Darwin being Darwin, he wants to know how had the finches done this? How did they develop new beaks? How could the birds pass on their new characteristics? Back in England, these questions preoccupy Darwin. But studying specimens from the Galapagos won't provide the full answer. So Charles Darwin does something extraordinary. This gentleman scientist leaves his respectable life for the country squire and makes his way deep into the slums of South London. He starts hanging around the pubs and the clubs chatting to the locals. He thinks that they may know something of importance. I don't actually breed blowers now, but I used to um, for a long, long time. And yeah, I used to train them in, you know, in the same way as we are now. Is the yeah. nodding important? Really, the more you can encourage them, the more to get them to, to respond. No, they're not impressed. Yeah, you're right. You've got to go one. That one's fine. I think I'm blowing mine up bigger She's than yours. She's very responsive. Yes, I like a responsive head. There you go. Darwin is fascinated by the weird world of fancy pigeons. He thinks there might be a useful parallel between what the breeders do to pigeons and what happens in nature to wild animals. He's keen to tap into their knowledge. Darwin writes, Since my admission into two of the London Pigeon Clubs, I have received the kindest assistance from many of the most eminent amateurs. Like Darwin, I found the pigeon breeders helpful. I've got a little dovecot on the farm and I was thinking about getting some fancy pigeons. 
to, to live in the dovecot, what do you think would be the best? You, you, want, you just want them to fly around. You want garden and farm tails. They're the ones. Yeah. Now, they, they, yeah, I know. But, Mike, come on, be honest. I will fly mine out. They go up like dots in the sky and they roll. I mean, they are a performing um, pigeon. Where can I buy pigeons from? Obviously, you two guys. <laughs> the reason Darwin is so keen on fancy pigeons is that this extraordinary range of breeds originally comes from just one type of bird found in the wild. These are rock doves, and although they appear plain, they are the ancestor of all fancy pigeons. When the fanciers spot characteristics in their birds that they like, big tails, fluffy heads, or a funny way of bobbing up and down, then they breed just those birds. But the key thing is that the different types all begin with chance variations spotted by the fanciers. You see, the eyes have got to be the same colour. So you're getting being, them with different colours? Well, with this being what they call a multicoloured bird, it's possible that the eye could be either black or orange, and as you can see, that's got an orange eye yeah. on that side, and it has on that side, so that's OK. If it had got a slight blemish in the eye, that would have been a fault, and it would have been straight back into the... Into the pen. So the breeding has to be very exact. So the breeders. Oh yeah, it's, so, it's just to be a good one. Yeah. So the, <laughs> so the breeders have to really look at their birds and think, well, that feature, I'm going to select that, and these will now be breeding birds, and the others I'll discard. Yes. So they're selecting all the every time. Every year, every year you select the best and breed from them and select again. Constantly and again. improving, constantly yes. improving. Yes. That's real, real artificial selection, yes. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. This very selective breeding produces pigeons with more and more extreme features. One pigeon breeder told Darwin that he could create new feathers in three years and a head and a beak in six. All this outlandish variety has been artificially fashioned by the pigeon fanciers. But in the natural world, there are no humans to bring about these kinds of changes in animals and plants. Something else has to be responsible. Darwin is trying to solve a great mystery. He wants to find out how evolution happens, how species might change, and how this change is passed on to future generations. Darwin believes he has the answer. It was a simple but brilliant idea that no one else had thought of. He called it natural selection. It's all about death and survival. And what's more, he could see it at work in his own back garden. So that's where we're going, to recreate one of Darwin's most significant experiments. Right, where do you think? Well, well a few more here. yards and we're set up there, I think. I will be helping Toby Beasley, head gardener at Down House, the home of Darwin. Yeah. So what was the purpose of this experiment then? Um, well, basically, we're trying to demonstrate a struggle for existence. And in this particular case, it's a struggle between plant seedlings and their natural predators and things that are going to destroy them. Just like Darwin, we remove the turf from a rectangle just three foot by two foot. Uh, That's it. I think just like this corner. Oh, take that one out. I think Darwin has done it better than me. Wow. There we go. If we take all these little. We're not going to plant any new seeds. Just see what comes out of the soil. In the corner. And watch the seedlings as they fight to survive. When you do something like this and reenact what Darwin's done, you really sort of get under his skin almost and begin to see what he was trying to achieve when you, you, you got your hands in the soil and, 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 and going through the same steps. And what Darwin found came largely down to very careful thought. So he was thinking about how things were working in the wild all around him and then trying to find a method to demonstrate that in these small, very simple experiments. It's classic Darwin. A handful of sticks, a wheelbarrow and a patch of turf but it's about nothing less than understanding how the natural world works. From now on, we mark everything with a piece of wire. From March, roughly every month, we'll note how many seedlings die. Darwin's weed patch experiment 
is prompted by the brutal ideas of a political economist. Thomas Malthus was alarmed at the large numbers of poor people in places like the slums of East London. He calculated that the number of humans on Earth would double in just 25 years. Eventually, if left unchecked, the population would overrun the planet. The only reason the population hadn't run out of control is death. Death of the weakest through starvation, disease and war. Darwin's superb insight is that a similar struggle to survive rages throughout the natural world. Deadly assassins stalk the seedlings. Slugs. Torrential rain. Drought. The best hope of survival, outdo your neighbor. Taste bitter to deter the slugs. Grow faster and grow tougher. Those who survive might live long enough to reproduce and pass on their successful characteristics to the next generation. This is the process Darwin calls natural selection. He writes, it is difficult to believe in the dreadful but quiet war going on in the peaceful woods and smiling fields. Okay, Toby, so it's going to be the final count on the, the weed patch experiment. That's it. And how's it looking so far? Um. Well, not too bad. Every time a seedling's germinated, I've basically been putting a piece of wiring just like this one down here. Right, so you've marked, every day you've been out here, and you've marked all the new seedlings that have popped up. That's it. And then we can see who's then been destroyed by snails and slugs and everything else, and who's survived. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it was a really nice uh, method that Darwin thought of to try and illustrate the sort of struggle for na uh, in, an, in nature, really. I mean, we look out over this sort of plot and see a nice, tranquil, harmonic existence. Yeah. But there's a lot of death it's and destruction. Death and there. carnage in there, isn't it? Just how bad was it? Every wire without a plant is a tiny gravestone for a dead seedling. We can now compare the number of survivors with the number of fatalities by counting the wires. So I had 55 and you had? 90. That means we've had a total of 454 seedlings have germinated in this patch right. through the life of the experiment, so since January. And that's 284 seedlings we've had die in total out of 454. Right. That is about a 62% yeah. death rate. So this is why Darwin chose to study seedlings, because that's the most vulnerable part of the plant's life when they face their highest mortality rate. That's it. This experiment drives home just how tough it is for seedlings to survive. In our weed patch, well over half the plants never make it. So simple seedlings, living or dying in a tiny weed plot. Now it took a real genius like Darwin to make a leap to a much bigger picture. Now he could see across nature, it was natural selection that decided who lives or who dies, who are the winners, who are the losers, and it's exactly that which drives the evolution of life on planet Earth. On his voyage to the Galapagos, Darwin saw that the natural world was often a brutal place. Now it's clear to him that the winners are those individuals who happen to be stronger, cleverer, faster than others in their species. They're the ones most likely to reproduce and so have offspring similar to themselves. Losers usually fail to reproduce, and so over many generations, the qualities that help survival are emphasised. Qualities that don't help survival disappear. And new species are slowly, relentlessly created.
For Darwin, natural selection means the survival of the strongest and fittest. But he's not only talking about the physically fit, but also the best fit to the environment. This is more subtle and more interesting. To investigate this, there's no need for world travel. Darwin just goes around the corner from Down House, and so will I. This is Great Puckland's Meadow. Darwin sees the meadow as a microcosm of nature at large. What looks like a uniform field of grasses actually has many different environments. Everywhere Darwin looks, he finds evidence that species survive and evolve by finding the niches that best suit. Darwin goes on to count exactly how many species he can find in Great Pucklands. For 12 months, he crisscrosses the meadow and records everything. It's the first time anyone has done such a detailed survey of plant life. A century and a half later, I've joined staff from the Natural History Museum and others to repeat Darwin's study. But I need to know what to look for. What do I do? How do you do it? Observe is the first thing. I think that is the key, is don't just quickly look and think, right, oh, that's all the same. You look at this piece of grassland here and quick look, you probably think, one or two things. There are probably about 20 different species of grass here. This is Coxfoot, Dactylus glomerata, one of the commonest British plants. Here's another one, that's a different plant. That's false oat grass, another extremely common plant. Let's find another one here. That's Yorkshire fog, another very common. So I've got three just within hand's reach, and probably if I go for a little bit further away, oh, there's another one there. <laughs> Wavy hair, no, Deschampsia, hair grass, another one, four. So you can see very quickly, even though if you don't know the names of these plants, they're you can different. see just by looking at them, you yeah. can see they are completely different. I never thought I'd be so interested in how many types of grass I can find in a meadow. Darwin reveals that this one meadow is crammed with many different grasses and other types of plant, all jostling for survival. He counts 142 species. We find almost as many, an impressive tally in a single meadow. Plants, like animals, fill different niches. Certain plants are better at living in slightly wetter conditions, slightly drier conditions. For example, here, the top of this hill here, where we're on Pucklands Meadow, the soil is slightly acidic. So there are plants here that like slightly acidic soil. And as you go over the hill on the edge down there, you go into an area where the soil is chalky. So plants, like us, we tend to sort of fit what's best for us. Darwin knows that the struggle for existence doesn't just set neighbour against neighbour. He's the first to realise just how intricate the connections between plants, insects and other animals can be. To explain what I mean, I need to go back to my farm. Darwin never did this experiment, but he does describe the thinking behind it. That's enough for me to run it with the help of my mate Dolly. Through here, Dol. In this wheelbarrow, something slightly unusual, it's uh, some bumblebee nests. And these are for an experiment I'm going to carry out. And it's an experiment that Darwin didn't really have a chance to, to carry out. So it might be a bit hit and miss. It doesn't just include bumblebees. It's going to be a bit of fun. Through here, Dolly. Okay. The experiment begins with a surprising suggestion. The number of cats on a farm will affect the amount of red clover in nearby fields. On the surface, cats and flowers look as if they've nothing in common. But delve deeper, as Darwin does, and you begin to see that life connects in curious ways. Cats eat field mice, of course. Less obvious, is that field mice can wreck bumblebee nests and eat young bees. So Darwin realises the more cats in an area, the more mice get eaten. And therefore, more bumblebee nests should survive. But that's not all. Red clover can only be pollinated by bumblebees. So Darwin's prediction, 
The more cats in an area, the more red clover. Right, let's put these hives out. Where should I put this one? Uh, put that one at the end. So we're putting these hives here because it's close to the barn. And they're close to the barn because that's where the cats live. Yeah. And the idea of having the beehives close to cats is that the cats will scare away the field mice. And the field mice raid the beehives. They raid them and they eat the young bees and everything else. If we're close to the, the cats, the cats will chase them away and, and hence the bees will be safe. That's the theory. That's the theory. So the first set of hives next to the barn should be untouched. We're going to put a second set of bumblebee hives in a field as far away from the cats as possible. Got that. You put that over there on that side. And I'll put in the middle? Or yeah, the I'll, end? I'll, we'll put it in the middle. I'll put mine at the end. Okie dokie. This is the second site. And we're going to put these out exactly the same way as we've done the others. Okay. The only difference here, no cats. So these beehives should be attacked by the mice. But it's not as simple as that. I mean, you've got foxes here, you've got owls, all lots of other predators, stoats and weasels. Yes. Um, so we'll see. But the main difference between this site and, and the other site is the fact that there's an absence of cats. Our whole experiment depends on a field mouse willingly entering a hive of bumblebees. To check this out, we caught one and tempted it with a bumblebee nest to see what would happen. I assumed the field mouse would be too scared of being stung. Yet the greedy fellow still went for it. So, it's clear our experiment might just work. Right, time to check out the bumblebee hives. These ones are near the cats. Now, what I'm looking for is any predation by, by mice. So. Let's have a look at the first hive. There's a couple of bees poking their heads out. No signs of mice. You'd expect some droppings or someone that's chewed around the, the wooden parts of the, the hive. Oh, yeah, very active. You can hear that rumbling. But I've just disturbed them. Right, number two. OK, there's bees in here. But again, there's not much activity of mice at all, though. Definitely expect some droppings or something. Right, this one here. Oh, yeah, plenty of bees. Look at that. <laughs> so it looks like they're either very lazy mice or the cats have done their job here. Now over to the field far from the barn. I doubt the cats have been up here. Now, the bee just flew out. Yeah. OK. Busy little hive. Not as many bees as uh, down by the uh, farm. But it's still there. Now, this is interesting. Now, here, there's nice and clean. The bees have been very busy cleaning their hives. There's no debris. Here, there's lots of debris. There's not a lot of activity. Ba bum Empty hive. It's completely dead. Completely dead. What about... Oh, this one's active. Yep. OK, healthy hive again. Not masses of bees, but um, still bees there. This one completely dead. So, has a mouse done this or not? There's all this debris here and these tall weeds, so it just looks like a derelict house. And there's even... Looks like dried mouse droppings here. And unfortunately for these guys, 
it was the end of the road. The results are in. Out in the field, one hive has failed. Yet over by the barn, all three hives are thriving. Of course, I can't claim much from such a small-scale experiment, but it looks to me as if Darwin might have been right with his prediction. The number of cats does seem to influence the success of bumblebees, and therefore the amount of red clover. Who'd have thought it? As Darwin put it, how complex and unexpected are the checks and relations between organic beings which have to struggle together. Darwin's experiments have built up powerful evidence for his theory of evolution. But he is well aware of a weakness at the heart of all his research. The ability of seeds to travel the world, the diversity of life, the struggle for existence, the evolution of new species. The weakness of Darwin's theory is the length of time it all takes. He knows that the wheels of evolution turn very slowly. Without enough time, without millions upon millions of years, evolution simply could not have happened. Darwin has to establish the true age of the Earth. By good fortune, his house is perched on the edge of the South Downs. It sits on the geological clue that might help save his theory. By the 19th century, geologists have mapped out the rock formations of Britain. They have discovered that the North and South Downs are actually the remains of an ancient chalk mountain nearly 50 miles across. Darwin's masterstroke is to try to calculate how many years it took for this huge mountain of chalk to erode and leave the gentle rolling countryside of the Downs we see today. If Darwin can work this out, it'll give him the age of this part of Britain. Like it <laughs> <laughs> sort of squeezes you all in the wrong places. <laughs> it's definitely the bum area. To help him figure out the rate of erosion, Darwin takes an interest in coastal cliffs. That's why I'm here with a dozen coast guards and Rory Mortimer, professor of geology at Brighton University. We've got 50 metres of cliff here, something like that, 50 metres, and we're going to go down through a little time elevator, looking right. at the layers as we go. So it's like a time machine? Yeah, fantastic. OK, it's not the first time you've done it. No, first time for you. First time for me. A little bit nervous. The pigs will miss you. They will. <laughs> Hang on. In Darwin's day, estimates of the Earth's age differ wildly. Based on a literal reading of the Bible, some theologians plump for just 6,000 years old. Darwin knows this is way too recent. He and most Victorian geologists suspect the Earth is much older, but there are few hard figures. This doesn't deter Darwin. So, Rory, I, I mean, I was really surprised to find out that, that Darwin's first and foremost love was actually geology, not biology. He was a very good geologist, and in fact he came to cliffs like these to understand time, geological time. But, you know, 20, 20, 30 feet down a cliff, what does that really represent? Well, this represents here, as far as we've come, perhaps 100,000 100, years of cliff. You see, we've got these wonderful flint bands going as horizontal layers across the cliff. Each flint band representing perhaps 20,000 years of Earth's history. So there's a lot of time locked into these cliffs. Modern geologists use sophisticated dating techniques to analyse the chalk in between the flint bands. Darwin has none of these methods to age rocks. Instead, he has ingenuity and the speed at which the sea erodes the chalk. As you can see, these are wonderful white cliffs and we can see they're cracked. Amazing. And beneath us, the sea comes in, it breaks against the base of the cliff, 
it erodes it away. So the sea is slowly eating away the rock and the rock then falls away? Yes, and calculations, even in Darwin's day, were made on these cliffs. And Darwin used those calculations to work out the rate of erosion of the landscape in southern England. Darwin takes the figure for cliff erosion, about an inch a century, and applies it to the ancient chalk mountain that had once existed. Now he can calculate how long the sea would have taken to erode the dome away. Here's how it goes. If the sea erodes an inch of chalk in 100 years, then to erode one mile of chalk, it will take the sea over 6.3 million years. To erode a chalk mountain nearly 50 miles across will take much longer, almost 50 times as long, and the total time, 306,662,400 years. Darwin estimates that the whole of South East England is at least this age, and planet Earth must be even older. In fact, modern scientists have discovered that the Earth is at least 4 billion years old. With Darwin's clever calculation, he has everything he needs to make his theory work. Enough time for evolution to happen. Even though much of the science is in place, Darwin still lacks a final element, the confidence to make his ideas public. From the start of his work, Darwin worries about the scientific and religious backlash. When he first recognises the power of evolution, he writes, it's like confessing to a murder. His wife Emma is in no doubt about the principal victim. God is missing from her husband's universe. She feels her husband risks eternal damnation. Think how hard it must have been for the two of them. Although Emma loved her husband, she was a devout Christian, and she was really worried where his work was heading. So what did they do about the problem? They avoided it. Night after night, they sat here and played backgammon, not talking about evolution. Typical of Darwin, he keeps a record of every game they play. I wonder how Darwin can gather so much evidence in support of his theory and still be reluctant to publish. So I asked Professor David Cohen, he hides his theory. He really delays, keeps it virtually a secret for many years. I mean, he only tells one person during a 15, 16 year period about natural selection. You know, the calm, the sort of the bright face of nature having underneath it this war of all against all. Mm. And part of his job as, a, as, a, uh, as an exponent of this theory is to bring people to understand the relationship between the harmony in nature and the beauty in nature and the diversity in nature and this individual struggle that's going on underneath between you know, all, all organisms. What Darwin has discovered in natural selection is a law that explains the origin of species and the origin of adaptations. In other words, all the diversity of life and it pushes God out of that business in the way that, in a way that, in a sense, the discovery of gravity pushes God out of controlling the fall of every, you know, every feather. At the heart of Darwin's theory is the idea that species evolve over millions of years. Go back in time and you find that all animals have common ancestors. Find these shared ancestors and you find proof of evolution. Let me show you what Darwin means when he uses the term shared ancestry. I keep a lot of pigs, a lot of different rare breed and different forms of pigs. This one here is a Tamworth, lovely pig with a, a lovely sort of gingery coat. And this one here, totally different. This one's a saddleback. That's a black pig with a lovely white band. They may all look different, but they have a lot in common. They're all pigs, and you don't need much imagination to work out that umpteen generations ago, they all had the same ancestor. In theory, you could go all the way back to a wild boar that was tamed in Europe six or seven thousand years ago. The big leap Darwin makes is to think the unthinkable. Where did the original wild boar come from? 
Was there a shared ancestor of wild boar with its other relatives, like the camel, hippo and goat? Eventually, a family tree for all mammals. If he's correct, it would mean that the pig shares the same ancestor as a dog and even a rabbit. But Darwin knows he has to find hard scientific evidence to prove this ancestry. One obvious place to look is fossils. We take them for granted, but in Darwin's day, they're big news. At the Great Exhibition of 1851, people flocked to see huge model dinosaurs based on fossils that have just been found. Some think fossils are animals that failed to make it onto Noah's Ark and drowned in the flood. But Darwin is sure there will be key evidence that animals have evolved. He expects to find fossils of intermediate forms that provide the link between different groups of animals. But none have yet been discovered. Without these elusive shared ancestors, Darwin has to look elsewhere. He goes back to the womb. It's an ingenious move. Darwin compares anatomical drawings of different unborn animals. This is a four-week-old human embryo. It has gill arches and a tail just like a fish. Here is another four-week-old embryo Darwin studies. A dog, it has a tail but it also has gill arches. The dog embryo is uncannily similar to the human one, but they turn into very different creatures. All embryos have features which have no function in later life, but are shared across a range of animal groups. For Darwin, these vestiges are powerful evidence of our shared ancestry. Embryology is to me by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of change of forms. Just as all domesticated pigs can be traced back to a single ancestor, so all mammals can be traced back to a single earlier vertebrate. Darwin argues that all life can be traced back to a single point of origin. This is the underlying meaning of Darwin's tree of life, sketched many years before. All life on Earth is related, and its beginnings can be found in what he calls a warm little pond, the origin of all species. Darwin's achievement is to explain how life evolved through natural selection. And this is why he is the greatest biologist of all time. But we nearly didn't get to hear about it. Darwin outlines his theory and then hides the manuscript in a cupboard underneath his stairs. He's terrified of the reaction if he publishes. After all, he's sure his theory explains life on Earth without the need for God. Darwin is also a perfectionist and he thinks that his ideas can be improved with just one more experiment or one more observation. In the end, he doesn't choose to publish, he's forced to. Here's what happened. In the early summer of 1858, a young naturalist working in the tropics, Alfred Russell Wallace, sends Darwin a draft of a paper for his opinion. Darwin is horrified by what he reads. Because Wallace has come up with the same theory, evolution through natural selection. Panic-stricken, Darwin writes to a friend. I never saw a more striking coincidence. If Wallace had my manuscript sketch written out in 1842, he could not have made a better short abstract. All that research, all that waiting, and now the credit for his life's work is about to go to someone else. It seems particularly harsh on Darwin. 
Wallace's theory is still in its infancy. Darwin has toiled for nearly two decades to back up his theory with observations and experiments. Darwin's friends suggest a solution. Later that same year, an outline of Darwin and Wallace's ideas on evolution are presented in a joint paper at a small scientific meeting in London. Remarkably, those present failed to grasp the full implications of the theory. Now Darwin feverishly turns his manuscript and experiments into a book. It takes him 16 months. This time he has determined the world will take notice. On the 24th of November, 1859, Darwin finally publishes On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. All the investigations we've recreated are in there. Seeds and salt water, the chalk cliffs, cats, bees and mice, the weed patch. In the book, Darwin lays out his detailed scientific argument that we've followed to show that life on Earth evolves through the mechanism of natural selection, without God. The book cost 15 shillings. It will change the world forever. After a quarter of a century of hard work and anxiety, Darwin had finally presented his theory to the world, but he still was not satisfied. He knew that there were gaps in his argument that his critics would pounce on. So true to form, Darwin goes back to the laboratory. In the next episode, Darwin plunges into another round of investigations. He tries to find out why peacocks have such long tails and how orchids have sex. And these experiments lead to the biggest question of all. How have humans evolved? Darwin provokes a storm of controversy that still rages to this day.